exploring the universe. Yeah, so the, the, the why, it's always important to explain the why of things. And uh, the why of Starship is that uh, we want to be a multi-planet species to extend consciousness beyond Earth, I think for two main reasons. One is to ensure the long-term survival and prosperity of life as we know it in consciousness, um, which if we are a multi-planet species and ultimately a multi-stellar species out there among the stars, the probability of survival is much, much longer. Um, that's kind of the you know, defensive aspect or life insurance for life collectively. But then there's also, there also need to be things that are inspiring and exciting and that give you reason to live. Life cannot just be about solving one tragic problem after another. There must be also reasons to get, get up in the morning and be excited about the future. And a future where we are a space ring civilization is infinitely more exciting than one where we are not. And we're doing it all pretty unique location. I mean, the pads behind us, we got rocket on the tower, we got another tower with it. We're sitting inside Star Factory. And I mean, it wasn't like this for very long. This is all pretty brand new. Yeah, I think we moved Starship here in about the early part of 2019. So we've been coming that entire time and seeing the site evolve from a double wide trailer and a tent where we built Starhopper to the first suborbital test flights. And now we have behind us two towers for the first time uh, as, as we build towards the first operational flight from the second tower at the end of this year. And this beautiful uh, building, million square feet, where we're able to work towards a production line of Starships. Yeah, this, the, the, the SpaceX team has done an incredible job of building out um, really the, the most advanced rocket uh, manufacturing facility that has ever existed. This, this is far beyond any rocket fabrication facility that has ever been built. This is essentially alien level technology and it was all built here uh, basically down by the Rio Grande River and close to the beach. It's an incredibly imp improbable location. And this used to be a sandbar. I think we're about, you know, three feet or about a meter above sea level. Um, so um, it's re it really <laughs> was, was nothing. If you see the time lapse from uh, sandbar to uh, two, ta two launch towers um, and a gigantic rocket factory with, uh, with high bays, and we're, we're going to be building something called the Giga Bay, which is like a one of the, the largest enclosed volumes on Earth. Uh, so, so it's sort of like a gigantic Borg cube uh, that we're gonna be building here for, uh, yeah, for, for, for building and storing these uh, gigantic rockets. Uh, it's really spectacular and anyone can come and visit. So the, because we're on a public highway um, and we're literally by a public beach, uh, you can actually come and see the rocket. You can you, quite close up. I mean, you can drive past it and, uh, and you can also look at the factory, and anyone could do this from anywhere in the world. So if you, just, you can come and visit and, and check it out. So just, I think it's pretty cool that it's... Just that, not right now. Just not right now. <laughs> just not right Obviously now. Obviously not when we're launching because there's some safety <laughs> issues, but, 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 the, but the rocket's often just, sit, just sitting on the pad without any propellant in it, and then you can just... You can just come here and visit. It's for very easy. Yeah, I think it's a really special place. Yesterday, this the ship went down the road behind us, and I saw families outside going for their, or was yeah, on Sunday going for their Sunday stroll, and they were greeted by Starship going down. And I think that from the very beginning, the thing about Starship different than Falcon and other rockets that I'm aware of is we designed it to be mass produced and mass produced at scale. And it's not about building one. Starship and getting to orbit once. It's about doing it in a sustained and rapid way. Yeah, we're aiming for ultimately thousands of shifts to be built per year, which is what's needed in order to uh, construct a city on Mars that is self-sustaining. And the, the major fork in the road of destiny will be when uh, the Mars city is capable of surviving, even if the resupply shifts from Earth stop coming for any reason. And that reason could be something cataclysmic, or it could be that it, it, that civilization simply subsided. Um, there's always this debate throughout history of will civilization end with a, a bang or a whimper. But either way, um, if the, the, the critical thing is to get to the point where Mars is self-sustaining and can survive even if the resupply ships stop coming for any reason, which means that you need to build an entire base of industry on Mars in order for Mars to survive. For example, it's not simply enough to build a chip 
uh, you know, like a computer, like a computer chip factory, but you need the ability to build computer chip factories. Um, so this uh, this is going to really take a, a lot of tonnage. I mean, my, my guess is at least a million tons to the surface of Mars, and um, maybe it takes less than that. But uh, it's going to be it's going to be a lot. Um, but this is uh, this is a very exciting future. Uh, it's one which will ensure the long term uh, survival and prosperity of of life and consciousness, and and it's the critical stepping stone uh, to get from uh, this solar system to uh, other star systems, and perhaps go out there and explore, and, and perhaps we'll encounter uh, alien civilizations that maybe that maybe they're alive now, but or maybe they enjoyed a period of prosperity for millions of years, and but also died out millions of years ago. So it's uh, humbling to think of the age of the universe according to the standard model of physics being approximately 13.8 billion years old. So uh, an incremental million years would, only, would be uh, three digits past the decimal point. And if you look at, say, our civilization and measure our civilization by uh, the first evidence of writing, which is about 5,500 years ago, um, civilization as measured from the first writing is only one millionth of Earth's existence. Or blip. Yeah. yeah. Flash in the pan so far. Yeah. Well, we're getting some cool shots. Rock it out on the pad right now. We, we tell people, like, come down, see it. It's hard to get, like, a sense of scale of just how massive this thing is. And we were able to catch somebody working on it um, a little while ago. And, like, part of the reason you said we're, we're sending millions of tons, that's kind of why this well, thing I is think so in this image, Dan, you can actually see the person working at the bottom of the ship. And as we zoom out, you see the full ship, that sort of two-tone silver and black, and then the booster below it, right? And it really sets the scale, which doesn't come across, I think, other than in person. And I, when I do tours, I like to say Starship is real, Starship is big, and Starship is really big. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see there, and with the factory shots you saw earlier, again, it's, we've got Flight 10 on the pad, but we've got many more behind it. Yeah, so there's, I posted a video uh, yesterday of just a, a brief scan of part of the Starship factory, and you can get a sense of this, the scale of the factory. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess we could talk a bit about uh, why Starship is the way it is. Um, you know, like, for example, why is half of the ship uh, black and half of it is silver colored? And that's because uh, the bottom half of the ship, the bottom as seen from orbital entry is has a, a heat shield on it so the, the black there is the is the heat shield and the and, and then the, the core structure of the rocket is um, a special alloy of stainless steel um, and uh, and that's where you see that the sort of shiny silver parts are stainless steel um, the reason for steel over aluminum is that uh, the heat of of um, atmospheric entry and the heat of the the rocket engines uh, is uh, enough to melt easily, easily melt aluminum, but steel is much more resilient uh, against both ascent heating, uh, but especially uh, the uh, reentry heating. And, um, and you don't have to paint it, uh, which is um, actually very difficult at, to paint a large object that is going through cryogenic cycles and have the paint stay on. It's quite uh, challenging. And so we've talked about it. it. It's massive. It obviously takes a whole lot of energy to make that thing move. And that's where Raptor really starts to come in. Most advanced engine on the planet. Giant uh, yes. lightsaber. No, that's a lightsaber and a half. <laughs> um, you would get vaporized in an instant if you were standing in front of Raptor. So, uh, yeah, burnt to a crisp in a, in a like of less, less than a second. Um, so, yeah, so in, in order for, uh, in, in order to create um, a fully reusable orbital rocket, uh, you have to advance the state of the art in every part of the rocket. That means the engines have to be better than any engine ever. The structure's got to be better than any structure ever. <laughs> you've got to, um, you've, you've, you've got to have um, a means of bringing the rocket back to the launch pad. You've got to have a fully reusable orbital heat shield, and that no one has ever made a, a fully reusable orbital heat shield. The space shuttle, for example, required um, nine months of refurbishment between flights. So the, the, the space shuttle heat shield would come back essentially partially broken and would require um, many months of, of re, uh, refurbishment in order to fly again. 
what we're trying to achieve here with Starship is to have a heat shield that can be flown immediately. So um, the ship, both, both the ship and the booster would be caught by the tower arms. Um, and the, the, the booster would be placed immediately back on the launch stand. And the, ship, the ship's got to orbit Earth at least once. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, but, but then could be back potentially in one orbit, but in most cases, several orbits. Um, so the ship would come back several hours later, but then be caught by the arms and placed on top of the booster. You could also have multiple ships ready so that uh, a single booster could service uh, five or more ships so that you, you could be flying the booster every, in theory, every hour. Um, this is a, kind of a profoundly fast speed, obviously, for the largest flying object by far ever made. Um, but it's the reason why we catch the tower, we catch the, the booster with the tower arms, and the ship also will be caught with the tower arms, because that's the fastest way to get the, the booster and the ship back to flight. Um, if we had instead put, put landing legs, which we have done before for the, the, the ship tests, we actually had landing legs that flipped down and uh, the, the ship, would, ship we've, we've successfully demonstrated uh, landing with legs. Uh, but if you do that, if, if we were to do that with the booster and the ship uh, here, we'd have to uh, land somewhere else with the legs, then lift the rocket, stow the legs, transport the rocket back to the pad, with, uh, which is uh, very unwieldy when you've got mm -hmm. a gigantic thing. Then it would be picked up by these tower arms and placed in the uh, launch mount. Um, that would, that would uh, delay the reusability dramatically and would add a lot of mass with the landing legs. So that's why we catch the rocket with the tower arms, because it's the same tower arms that put the rocket in the launch mount um, are used to catch the rocket. Uh, and that means that we can put the booster back in the launch mount in less than an hour after liftoff. In fact, the booster is going to come back very fast, like you know, five or six minutes later, this booster is coming back one way or another, or not coming back. <laughs> Um, so, so then you really have propellant full time, which can be brought down to about 30, 40 minutes. And that means you, it is theoretically possible to fly the booster again in less than an hour. And I think when the, when I think about it, it's the jet drives up to the jet. It's really what's going to kind of unlock, you know, Starship going everywhere else, going everywhere, everywhere beyond earth. And that's something that's again, never been done before, kind of like that reusable orbital heat shield, but it's going to be something that that's kind of some of the other secret sauce to Starship, where we're going to be able to send hundreds of tons per ship to Mars. Yeah, I like to think of it as if we get to orbit with a full cargo bay, but we're empty on fuel and oxygen. So basically, we, we're running on fumes. Then we send other ships to dock, transfer propellant. And now we made our two-stage rocket look like a many, many multi-stage rocket. And we get all of that performance. And we can take that full cargo bay now wherever we want to go. Yeah, so a, a crucial technology that we hope to demonstrate next year is this orbital refueling, much like aerial refueling. It's essential for um, being able to send significant payload to Mars. So you essentially send, you send a ship to orbit with uh, a few hundred tons of payload, sort of a filled payload bay, uh, but the, the, once it gets to orbit, the, the tanks will be mostly empty. And then you send up additional tanker ships to refill the, the Mars ship's uh, tanks so that when it, so it, it can thrust from Earth orbit to Mars and have enough propellant left for landing. So this is, um, orbital refilling is also not something that's ever been demonstrated before, so that would be a brand new technology. Uh, we, we, have, we also have at SpaceX figured out how to dock repeatedly with the space station, so in a lot of ways this is uh, like docking. Um, and um, in some ways it's easier in that we're, the ship, we're, SpaceX is docking with its, with its own craft, um, but no one has ever demonstrated propellant transfer uh, in orbit, to the best of our knowledge, and uh, and so this would be propellant transfer at a very large scale, and um, but with full reusability and propellant transfer, uh, we th those are the, the key technologies needed for uh, building a city on Mars, and um, I'm confident that uh, the SpaceX team, which is incredibly talented, will achieve this uh, this these goals, and we will be landing ships on Mars in the future and building. Um, 
life on Mars, building greenhouses and and life on Mars and uh, ensuring the long-term survival of life as we know it. And it's important to note here that obviously, uh, in, you know, we are effectively stewards of life uh, here on Earth. That uh, the other creatures cannot build space, spacecraft and get to get to other planets. So if there were to be a cataclysmic event, like a giant meteor that destroyed the dinosaurs, um, or ultimately the sun will expand to envelop Earth and destroy all life, we know this, this, is, this is an undisputed fact, um, then uh, if we don't take life to another planet, uh, life, all life will be destroyed. So it's incumbent upon us to ensure that we do bring life to other planets and, and ensure the long-term survival of uh, life as we know it on planet Earth. And I mean, aside from that, there's so much that Starship unlocks by being able to do these things. Like, we'll be able to go to Mars, but there are other just transformational things by being able to take that many people, that much stuff to space for that much less money. Yeah, I mean, I think exp like understanding our planet better, being able to move people around the planet, make, the, make it feel smaller and more accessible. You could go anywhere on the Earth, you know, in less than 40 minutes, basically, in terms of flight time. So I, I really do see Starship as being this thing that can connect us, just like Starlink connects our information. This can connect us more physically. Yeah, so there's, there's really nothing faster than um, a rocket, really. An orbital rocket is the fastest thing um, that we know of that that uh, of the fastest means of transport. So, like you could go from LA to Sydney in less than half an hour. Um, you could go from LA to Tokyo in less than half an hour. You could go from New York to Singapore in half an hour. Everything's probably half an hour, basically. <laughs> Some things might be ten minutes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, sign me up for that, please. Um, all right, I mean, cool. cross the Atlantic in ten minutes, no uh, problem. Please. Yes, sign well, me up. You're going 25 times the speed of sound, so that's 30 times faster than, than a commercial aircraft. And it's a whole hell of a lot better view. Yeah, it's a hell of a view. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, anything else, guys? Anything else? Well, they, I really mean, we, we could say out? a lot more. I, <laughs> yeah. I just, maybe we should go check in on the rocket yeah. and get All on right, console. We're going to go back on console. To, hopefully, the weather supports the launch tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah. All Thanks right. for your support. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for crashing, Bye. guys. All right.